Uh, my name is Connor O'Sullivan. I'm the head of sound design at Google, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk about sound design and sonic brand. So today I'm going to talk about how we approach sound design at Google, um, how you can think about sound as part of the user experience, and I'm really excited to be able to announce the release of the first ever material sound design guidelines. So starting today, you can make full use of the material guidelines, uh, learn about best practices for designing with sound, and you can even download product sounds for you to incorporate into your own products. So you can find the guidelines at uh, this URL from the main um, material page either. And these guidelines are for product sounds. So product sounds are a little bit different from other types of sounds or sound design that you may be familiar with, such as sound design for movie, TV, or gaming. For product sound design, you're trying to create an experience that has both function and aesthetic, and one that stands up to interaction over time. And this can become a central and valuable part of the product. So at Google, we've realized that in order for us to use sound in an, in an intelligent and meaningful way, we had to fundamentally rethink what it means to design sound for product experiences. So we've decided to share our learning from this work and make available our techniques and best practices for anyone to use as part of their product. And these techniques can be used by anyone considering the use of sound as part of product design, not just sound designers, but we do provide an additional level of detail uh, for people more familiar with sound and composition. So just to step back a little bit and think about the role of sound in our lives. As humans, we're constantly experiencing sound. Uh, sound is everywhere, and we even experience it when we sleep. Sound comes in omnidirectionally, so it comes in in 360 degrees. And we don't always notice it. But when we do, it's because our brains have detected a change in the sound and decided that we need to pay attention. So as sound designers, we can take advantage of this fact to create a soundscape that sometimes recedes into the background and other times grabs your attention. And the sound that a listener hears can have a powerful impact on their perception of a product or of an experience. And sound has been shown in research to impact the perception of things like quality, time, and emotion, for example, with quality, where in one study, people were motivated to spend more money depending on whether they were listening to classical music uh, versus popular music. Or in time, where people, their perception of time changed depending on whether they were hearing familiar or unfamiliar music. And we know as well that people attribute positive emotions to what they see when they hear happy sounds. So good sound design will generate an emotional connection between the listener and the experience. And when we get it wrong, it not only stands out, but it can have negative consequences. So we're all familiar with product sounds interjecting an alert throughout the day. And we all know how annoying hearing lots of these things can be. So we need to be careful about overusing sound. But worse than all of this, poorly designed sound can have the power to have truly disastrous consequences. There's been a lot of research done in the aviation and medical industries around the role of sound. And in aviation, for example, studies have shown that flight crew were more concerned with turning off a warning sound rather than understanding the underlying cause of that sound. Or in the medical field, where a majority of anesthetists admitted to deactivating sound warnings because the sound itself was displeasing. And if you think about the range of medical equipment sounds out there, all making sound, a study has shown that only 3% of them actually signaled real risk to the patient. 
And perhaps even more scary, um, patients were shown to experience more pain when there is a lot of background noise versus in a quieter environment. So it's safe to say then that considering the role of sound as purely around sound effects or decoration is not going to make for a successful product experience. And thinking of designing sound as designing clicks and beeps, as far as I'm concerned, those days are over. So there's many considerations that a sound designer takes into account when approaching a new project. For example, on the design side, things like um, the UX principles or the usability involved, or what's the brand and personality. Whereas on the sound side, a sound designer will look at things like acoustics and psychoacoustics to think about things like pitch, rhythm, loudness, what environment are we hearing the sounds in and what's the reverberation like. And then there's even more advanced considerations. Uh, so increasingly, as we think about the role of machine intelligence, sound can be enhanced, such as thinking of sound as a service or how does machine intelligence help with sound personalization and contextualization? And these are all things that we consider at Google. So we've taken our learnings and captured them in the first ever material sound design guidelines. And these guidelines give you practical techniques for incorporating those considerations into your design process. Explanation of how sound is broken out for material and also tools that you can use as part of your design process. So we're going to dive through the material guidelines now, and you can follow along on the breadcrumb trail on the top, just so you know where we are in, in the guidelines. But they're organized in the following way. I look at principles and how to use them to guide the design process and an overall look at sound, applying sound to UI, so how to best use sound for different scenarios. A look at attributes, which includes a little bit more detailed information for sound designers. Choreographing sound. So this is how to create a sound system and think about building and bringing them together. And then technical optimizations, which is how to get the best sounding product. We also give sounds for development, which includes some free sounds that you can use right now in your product. So this first section is around the principles and approach to sound. So for material, we take a first principles approach to designing with sound. And these principles are based on sounds being informative, honest, and reassuring. So for informative, at their core, sound should always have a functional reason to play. So they exist to provide information and contextual cues to the listener. For honest, inherent in the sound is an honest expression of the personality and brand identity of the product experience. So for example, at Google, for the sound that someone could choose for their pixel notification, where we want to offer people more of a personal expression of their own identity, that sound's going to be different from the type of sound that we would play as default, say, on Google Meets where we know people are more likely to be in a work environment encountering the sound. For reassuring then, sound has a role to play in assuring the listener that we're on top of things, we're being open and transparent about our communication to you, and that we're also being respectful about when and where you hear the sound. Another very important tenet is the idea of silence. So understanding how to use silence and often assuming silence by default is very important. So it's the visual equivalent of less is more or working with negative space. And the first question I'll always ask a product team if they approach me to request a new sound is, do we really need it? Or have we thought about the role of silence in balancing out the overall soundscape? A note on visualization too. So we've found it really helpful when designing sounds to represent attributes of the sound visually. And this is not only useful for the sound designer, it's also quite useful as part of design reviews, where if you have a visual representation of the sound, it makes it a lot more digestible for people. 
so that they can hear and see things together. It makes it easier to talk about the sound. And there's different ways to visualize sound dynamically. Here are three that we found to be useful. The first one, of course, is time-based, so visualizing a waveform in real time. This helps people understand the shape and liveliness of the sound. So sounds with faster percussive moments or softer ambient sounds all look different when displayed in this way. For example, does anyone recognize that sound? So if you know that sound, you probably have a Google Home in your, in your house. Uh, but visualizing sound this way helps facilitate discussion around the movement of the sound. And if you want to focus on other aspects of the sound, it's often useful to think about how and where it occupies the frequency spectrum. So doing this can highlight where one sound lives relative to another. For example, we're going to hear the previous sound that we heard, but it's visualized in a different way. So this can reveal unique characteristics about how the sound moves from one pitch center to another, like we just saw. But for a deeper dive into the character of the sound, you want to think about the attributes that we call timbre. And timbre is a sometimes hard to define quality of the sound. But the classical way to describe timbre is that if you have two notes at the same pitch and for the same duration, timbre is the quality of the sound that makes one sound like a violin and another a piano, for example. So timbre describes characteristics of the sound. And there's more technical ways to think about timbre, but this gives you an idea. So in visualizing timbre, you can use many different aspects or attributes of timbre to visualize where a sound lies in the timbre space. But for a well-designed product ecosystem, you should have a good understanding of what your particular timbre space is for your product. So here's an example which shows how sound can vary digitally to acoustically across the timbre space. So as you hear the sound, it'll become progressively more acoustic. So let's touch on the type of sound that we have in UX design. We think about sound categories for products in terms of sound, music, and voice, and each have their own role in communicating information and brand identity to the audience. So, so much of the information that we convey to people today is visual or screen-based, and sound offers us a great opportunity to offset some of the burden of demands that we place on the visual domain onto this other sense. Sounds great for providing state information quickly, uh, sometimes even subconsciously too. And sound can, can help establish personality, brand identity, and if done well, it can be an ownable asset to your product. Music is great for establishing emotional tone quickly. It supports storytelling, and of course, can be powerfully used in advertising. And voice works well for communicating more complex information non-visually, for conversational interfaces, and stylistically can be used to also inform your product personality. We're focusing on UX sound here for these um, principles and for the guidelines, but it's more important to be aware of and consider the role of music and voice and sound together as part of the overall product soundscape. The values and principles that you use to establish sound should be consistent and cohesive across music and voice too. So they should all work together. They should all feel like they come from the same family. The next section is applying sound to UI. And we found it helpful to apply some systems level thinking to our sounds, our UX sounds, and break them out into categories. So this effectively approaches the design and implementation of these sounds. So for system sounds, these comprise the nuts and bolts of our UX sounds. Ambient sounds are a way to provide uh, mood and emotional tone. Notifications are our attention-getting devices. Hero sounds are a way to celebrate unique moments in your product. And brand sounds then will capture the overall essence of your experience. 
So let's jump into primary system sounds. These are part of the product experience. They're heard the most frequently. And they're used to provide context or convey information to the user. So an example of primary UX sounds are scrolling sounds or sounds to support important motions, such as like a, a screen change or a sending animation, typing or other repetitive action feedback. And these sounds are always generally quite uh, short. I'm going to play an example here of primary system sounds on Google Home Mini. So you'll hear the volume increasing, hitting max, and then decreasing. So as these sounds are heard quite frequently, it's important that they uh, be able to stand up to use over time. And one method of doing this is to provide subtle variation and perform an algorithmic selection over a set of variable sounds. And this could be based on some input variable or even random selection. But what we're trying to do is mimic a more uh, real world or natural behavior of sound events. So for example, I could touch this podium 10 different times, and we're going to hear 10 different sounds. So building in subtle variation into the product experience is good material design behavior for sound. Here's a couple of examples. So the first one, we're touching an object three different times, and you hear three slightly different sounds. And the second one, we're swiping away objects, and again, you hear this subtle variation. So overall, primary system sounds should be a good aesthetic representation of the product soundscape without being overly intrusive. Secondary UX sounds are sounds that are heard less frequently as part of your typical user journey. So they're sounds to cover corner case experiences or just interactions encountered less frequently. So for this reason, they're highly indexed towards the fun functional end of the spectrum. And they're still part of the soundscape family, but they're not strong representatives of the brand or the branded experience. So an example of these sounds might be sounds for a thinking indicator or a low battery sound. Here's a couple of secondary sounds. Uh, this one for feed, re feed refresh, it's uh, quite subtle, I'll play it twice. And this next one, for a sound to let you know that a button is inactive. And one tip with secondary system sounds, if memory constraints are an issue for your product or your application, um, consider lowering the resolution of secondary sounds. So you could lower sampling rate, um, you could reduce the number of channels, because these are going to be less frequently encountered sounds. Ambient sounds are used to create a sense of place uh, or to establish an emotional tone that enhances the connection with the product or with the experience. So these can be sound or music based like we're hearing now, uh, but they should be subtle enough to recede into the background, um, unless you're explicitly trying to create say more of like a game-like feel. An example of good use of ambient sound is sound to set a welcoming tone as part of an onboarding experience or uh, sound for setup experience in a product. Notifications then cover a wide range of feedback to users, things like alerts, message notifications, ringtones, timers, alarms. And they're often used in communication to imply some time-sensitive action. So as such, they're going to be more prominent and attention-getting than the UX sounds that we heard. So when thinking about the default for one of these categories of notification, you should consider this an opportunity to showcase the tone of your product experience. So this could be anything from a boldly designed new sound that embodies a new identity to something more subtle that's a gentle nod to your overall design philosophy. And here are two that we use on the Pixel. The first one there is our default notification called Popcorn. But in general, when you're designing a sound that needs to get the listener's attention, it's a good idea to have sound that has rhythmic or timbral variation so that the ear can latch onto it. Um, sounds that work well in noisy environments include high-frequency sounds, 
And broad spectrum sounds also work well in different environments. So we also recommend, if possible, to provide options uh, for people that allow for personalization and customization of their sound experience. It's great to have sounds that strongly represent your product, but also understand that providing an opportunity for people to express their unique voice as part of your product is very powerful too. So speaking of sound personalization, we recently released a total redesign of the Pixel Sound Picker experience. And we use some cool technology to provide dynamic visualization to the sounds that people preview. Here was an early sketch of what the motion might look like. Here's how the visualization ended up on the redesigned sound picker. You can see it there on the left, where the visuals react in real time to the sound. So we expanded the range of sounds in the cloud for people to download in the categories shown here in the middle. And here's a few examples of the range of sounds we have on Pixel. Ring, 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 ring. Voila. So the next category is hero sounds. And we think about hero sounds as UX sound moments that should stand out as a strong representation of the product experience. So think about one or two moments in your product that could be celebrated as the essence of what your product is about. You might find that adding a unique sound gives an opportunity to create more of a hero moment where the action or accomplishment of a user is celebrated in a way that's an authentic representation of your product voice. So for example, here's a hero sound we created for Google Files. So as with any kind of bigger sound, just be careful about overusing the hero sounds. Make sure that the moment of extra decoration is worth it, not in danger of becoming annoying. And a brand sound then might be worth considering if your product experience demands its own unique sound mark or a moment that represents the fundamental essence of the brand. And this can live inside or outside the product. So it could be used in advertising. If you do tutorial videos, you could use it to bookend those, um, maybe during the product boot up sequence. But this sound and your hero sound have the potential to become ownable assets for your brand. So treat them with respect and avoid overdoing it. At Google, we've designed a simple piano sound that sometimes accompanies the logo. It provides a nice, clean, uh, minimal auditory cue to the listener. It's this sound. And the piano is played fittingly in the key of G for Google. So this next section around sound attributes, we start to get into a little bit more detail for people with a sound background but also generally explain it too. But understanding the type of sound timbre you're going to need is, is gonna be key in finding the right style for your product. So we consider various aspects of sound attributes uh, that all comprise the overall timbre and behavior of sound. The first attribute to consider is whether you want to use tonal or more musical sounds. So sounds can be designed using tonal or atonal non-musical elements. Sometimes the sound will use both. Tonal sounds work best to communicate personality, emotion, and state changes. So for tonal sound, they're normally uh, short musical phrases, which we refer to as motifs. And we like to keep a motif under five notes if possible. Uh, the more you move beyond that, the more burden you're placing on the user uh, to remember the sound and the associated action. But there's fairly standard uh, common motifs that are used. So the first one is an upward motif, which tend to denote things like openness, positivity, initiation, or success. Second one, its counterpart, the downward motif, which denotes returning, closing, going back, or resolving. And then we have the repetition motif, 
which indicates progress indication or holding or processing. Atonal then, or non-musical sound, is another way to design sound. And think of these as textural or more noise-based elements. They're usually not pitched. Um, and I mentioned sometimes sounds are a mixture of both. So this first sound is an example of that. It has noise-based textures for the number input and then a more pitched resolution. It's quite a subtle sound, so I'll play it twice. So another technique then for using atonal sound is to use what we call skeuomorphic sound. These are sounds derived from real world examples. So they should be considered if there's a strong pre-existing history of association between the sound and the action. An example would be a camera shutter sound. So it's not required to use skeuomorphic, but it's good practice to at least consider that if there's a strong existing association. Another important attribute is dynamics. And dynamics in sound refers to how the volume changes between the loudest and softest parts. And this can be applied over one sound or a set of sounds. But consider using dynamic variation to introduce a more natural sonic behavior and to provide interest to the ear. So listen to these two sounds, uh, both short sounds. The first one becomes progressively brighter. It builds dynamically uh, as the pitch increases. So I'll play that one more time. And the second is flatter, and it has less dynamic variation. It doesn't feel as natural. So even in these short sounds, having a difference in dynamics is noticeable. The envelope of the sound, then, this refers to the shape of the sound's amplitude over time. So the two primary components to think about are the rise of the sound, which we call the attack, and the fall of the sound, we call the decay. And there's many more detailed and more complicated analyses of envelopes. For example, a lot of sound designers will be familiar with the ADSR, which uh, stands for Attack, Decay, Sustain, Release. But essentially, you want to think about the shape of the sound and what that does to the listening experience. So softer attacks will sound smoother and more ambient. Whereas harder attacks will be more, a little bit more aggressive and percussive. And these ones are really good for interjecting, uh, for getting your attention, or for creating the effect of tactility. So just like uh, the auditory equivalent of photo filters, there's lots of different types of effects that you can apply to create some interesting and complex responses in sound. For material, we recommend restraint here. Uh, less really is more, unless you have a unique and fun reason to go crazy with it. I'd say try to exercise restraint when you think about what the effect is adding to the overall sound palette. So two common effects are reverb and delay. And here's an example of what we consider good use of reverb versus excessive use. I'll play those again. So it's good use of reverb and excessive use. Oh, good use, excessive use. So generally, unless there's a really good reason for the effect to become a noticeable timbral element, um, think of it more as a light decoration. So it can be used to sweeten the sound, but not change its flavor altogether. In the next section, we look at how you can bring all these sounds together. Uh, consider how to build out the soundscape holistically. And we think of this as choreographing the sound. So think of the overall system of sounds that are required for your product experience and how these could be designed with a hierarchy in mind. Here's a typical hierarchy diagram that we'd recommend to map out the priority and prominence of sounds. So typically in the top half of this diagram, it's where you want to focus more of your time on indexing on the personality aspects of sounds. Say, for example, you're reviewing sounds with your work partners, maybe with a leadership team. The higher up on this chart you are, the more attention needs to be given to gaining the right level of buy-in to ensuring the sound becomes an ownable asset and one that works across your brand development and product ecosystem. 
So one thing that you also want to consider is what's your home base musical key going to be and how are other sounds going to work on top of that? And this is going to depend on how big or flexible the product ecosystem is, whether you're planning to introduce personalization or not, which will open up the range of keys. But consider the role of relational sounds. These are sounds that provide feedback for a pair of actions and the sounds themselves can be paired. So forward, backward, beginning, end, these can all have sounds that are related to each other, even if the sounds themselves aren't heard back to back. And this can be useful to subtly educate people over time as they get used to hearing the sounds after repeated use. So sounds that are meaningfully related, they help teach things like placement in the UI, uh, state changes, or a sense of urgency versus calm. And here's an example of good material sound practice so these sounds for related actions play in the same key. Here's one we don't recommend, where sounds that are for associated actions have different musical keys. So once the sounds are all designed, um, you should, if possible, and if your budget was to stretch for it, work with a sound designer or potentially even a mix engineer to think about how to mix or combine the sounds together. So for mixing, you want to consider the context and priority of the sound being played, as well as how the sound will be physically rendered. So will it be played over headphones, on a separate speaker, or maybe on a specific device? And even the shape of the way that one sound fades into another, um, this can have an impact on the experience of the product. So if this happens too abruptly or even too slowly, it can feel jarring, stilted, um, or just poorly designed. So here's an example of the same sound, which is mixed in two different ways. Again, short sound. And you can hear the emphasis on different parts of the sound in these versions. The last section is around optimization and audition. Auditioning, And this is the, one of the most important steps that you can take as part of the sound design process. It can be a highly iterative process, but it's absolutely essential to delivering a world-class product experience. So practically, practically speaking, if you're working on a product and uh, it's still in development, if your budget is to stretch, you can work with an audio, audio engineer, but you're trying to integrate this sound that you've designed into the product, inevitably, Inevitably, what you'll find is that the sound that you've designed on these pristine sound studio monitors and then had people maybe review on laptop speakers and it doesn't sound as good, ends up on a final product and sounds completely different than how you originally intended. And over time, a sound designer can account for this as part of the design process, but it can be quite a shock to the novice designer. So working to audition, iterate, and re-audition the sounds is absolutely vital and it's a necessary loop in the process. And by iterate, I mean reorchestrate the sound, uh, maybe perform EQ or equalization changes, or even redesign the sound. But the audition, iteration, re-audition step is vital. And it should be allocated the appropriate amount of, appropriate amount of time in the design process. So I remember I created over 100 different versions of the uh, big adventure ringtone, the default ringtone on Pixel. Um, so I just wanted to get it sounding, you know, exactly as I had originally intended on the final device. So I'm gonna play some of the early iterations and evolution of the sound, and then you'll hear the final ringtone. So it's worth taking time, I believe, to do this for a quality experience. So as part of the material guidelines, we've created a group of sounds that are freely available for anyone to use in their product. If you want to hear a bit more about that, uh, come to my box talk in the design sandbox either tomorrow or Thursday. 
And uh, you can hear more about how you can use those sounds in your product. So today I've shared some of the tools and techniques that we use in the craft of sound design at Google. I'm really excited to hear what comes next. So thank you very much. Thank you.